Well, hi, everyone. Um, let me begin by wishing all of you mothers who are, or who are listening today a happy and a, and a blessed Mother's Day. I recognize that this year Mother's Day is probably a whole lot different than it's been in other years with all of this, uh, these commands, if you will, these regulations that we stay home. Uh, your family is probably not going to be able to come and and visit with you. Uh, they're not going to take you out for dinner or anything like that, uh, any, or nothing probably special is going to happen, unless they are quite creative and are able to um, to do something special. But at least they'll be talking with you and, and uh, trying to make this a special day for you. So anyway, I just simply want to say a happy Mother's Day to you. It is your day. Uh, it's your day to be recognized. It's your day to be honored. And so I want to do that today and just acknowledge uh, the mothers who are listening uh, in this morning. The other thing I recognize about this particular Mother's Day, and actually any Mother's Day, is that for some people it's a, it's a hard day. It's a hard day because, you know, if you are a mother and you have perhaps lost a child, I would suspect that Mother day, Mother's Day is a, is a difficult day for you. Uh, and of course, anyone who has lost their mother, uh, sometimes Mother's Day can be a real difficult day. In the last two and a half years, uh, my wife and I have actually lost both of our mothers, and we uh, simply honor them today by remembering them, um, remembering their great love for us, and of course, remembering and acknowledging our love for them. And you can do that with your uh, mother as well. This morning, I want to talk about what I hope is a word of encouragement to you. I want to reflect with you uh, on some of the ways that God, our Father, uh, is indeed a perfect mother. Now, that might seem like a very strange kind of statement, but I think, you know, when you really think about it, I think that God is a perfect mother to us. Before I get into that, however, I want to kind of make a bit of a, of, of a disclaimer, and that is this, that I would never be one uh, to address God as, you know, our mother who art in heaven. And I say that because, uh, you know, when, when, when God revealed himself to the human race, <clears throat> he, he revealed himself as the father. And if that's how God reveals himself to us, then uh, I think what that means is that that is a true statement about him, that he is our father. And I, it's certainly a way beyond my pay scale anyway to think that I could or should change that. So I would never, I would never address God as our mother. And by the way, just to say a few more things about this, I hope that you are aware that God, our father, is neither male nor female. I hope that somewhere in your teaching, in your, in your reflections on God, you realize that because male and female are actually uh, created realities. Uh, are, God created those realities for this world in which we live. In Genesis, it says when God created humankind, he created them male and female. And while it's true that, that we as human beings are made in the image of God, uh, that doesn't mean that male and female actually describes God. It describes us as human beings. Male and female relates only to this earthly created order, and it doesn't relate to God and his, and his nature. God is neither male nor female. And, and I don't think we could even say that he is both male and female, because, because he's not. God is God. God is spirit. His being, his nature, I think is just way beyond anything male or female. And so for us to be made in his image and to be made as male and female in this dimension of things, I think that simply says that at a, in, a, in a fundamental kind of way, men and women are different, of course, uh, we know that, but they, they also uh, reflect different, but I would, I would say complementary aspects of, of God's character. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. <clears throat> With that disclaimer, I really want to focus on mothers today. And I want to talk about some of the characteristics of God that are, are particularly reflected in our mothers, in your mother and in, in my mother. And if you will allow me, I want to be a little bit, uh, or quite personal about that today. And I want to talk about my own mom, things that I have observed about her. And so that's kind of my way of honoring her today on Mother's Day, if you will allow me to do that. But I want to look at or mention four things about a mother's heart. And I want first to consider these things. They're things that reflect something of the motherly heart of God, our father. So let's look at them. Observation one that I want to share with you is this. I've observed that, that uh, a mother's heart 
always yearns for her children to be with her. And maybe you've noticed that too. Here's what I've observed about my own mother through the years. That my mom was never happier. She was never more content. She was never more in her glory than she was when everyone (laughs) was around. When everyone was at home, when all of her children and the grandchildren and actually many other people, anyone else who wanted to come, when they were actually at home, that made her happy. I remember in particular um, the, the, the Christmas of 2003. It was, it was after that Christmas, just after that Christmas, that my dad passed away. He wasn't sick. Um, no one expected him to be dying, but 10 days after that Christmas, my dad died. But that particular Christmas day... For the very first time in I don't know how many years, maybe it never happened before, I I can't remember, but certainly for the first time in many, many years, all of us, all seven of us kids, all of our spouses and all of our kids, all all of mom and dad's grandchildren, all of us were able to be there at home with mom and dad for Christmas dinner. Every one of us. Nobody was missing. 27 of us all together. And you know what? Mom was in her glory. That was probably one of the happiest days of the entire year for her, that Christmas day when everybody was there. And of course, everybody was helping to get the dinner ready and everybody had brought different pieces of the dinner. Uh, Mom was there working. She was preparing uh, dinner as well, but she was just in her glory. She was in her glory because the whole family was there. They were all under one roof and they were with her. They were with her. And you know, I, I, I picture her um, sitting in her chair after the meal was over. All of us were kind of uh, helping to clean up. We were doing the cleanup. We were putting things away and, and, um, and washing dishes and, and that kind of thing. And, and, and his mom's sitting in her chair, and she's a little tired. But, you know, there was this contented look on her face. And that contented look said this. It said, ah, everything is as it should be. Everyone is home. I think one of the yearnings of a true mother's heart is for those occasions and those times when all of her children can come home. And for that mother, I think the invitation is always open. When are you coming home or come home, the door is open as well. You know, as I thought about this, uh, this characteristic of, uh, of mothers, I was reminded of the account of Jesus that we have in the scriptures of him looking one day out over the city of Jerusalem. And part of what he said, I'm thinking part of what he said, part of what he said that day was this. It was a longing of his heart. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I longed to gather you together as, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Do you know what that is? That's a, that's a mother's heart. I was reminded of that. I, I was also reminded of how, how God, our father, and, and even Jesus himself, you know, they have this standing invitation to everyone, whether you're a believer or not, they have this standing invitation to come. God says, come to me. Jesus says, come to me. In essence, it's an invitation to come to your true home. It's to be with God. It's to live that with God life. There's the standing invitation, for example, in Isaiah chapter one and verse 18, where God says, says, come, he says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they will be as wool. An invitation to come home. There's that invitation of Jesus, a standing invitation in, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, where he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, friends, God, God longs for us to come to him. God longs for us to come home, whether it's, whether, you know, whether we're the prodigal sons or daughters, you know, whose lives are being wasted away in fruitless pursuits, his desire is that we turn and come home or whether it's, it's, it's for his children, true followers of his, who perhaps may be too busy in life to, to, to spend time sitting with him in prayer and in his word, too busy to be walking with him and talking with him. And the invitation there is to come. He longs for that fellowship. It's a motherly characteristic of our heavenly father. The other thing, by the way, that I was reminded of um, was that sneak preview that we have in the book of Revelation that the Holy Spirit gives us through John of God's yearning for us to come. And it's found in chapter 21. Listen to how he describes this as as he talks about the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21 verse 3. He says this, 
And I heard a voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, their home. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will dwell with them and will be their God. It's home. God has everybody home. Well, friends, if there's any encouragement in this for us today, I think it's this, it's to listen to the call of God is to hear the call of God in our inner beings, because I think God is always calling for us to come, you know, to come to him and his door was always open and he's there waiting for us to come. A mother's heart yearns for her children to be near to her. All right. Another observation I've made, and that is this, I've observed that a mother's heart always wants the best for her children. You've probably noticed that as well about mothers. You know, my mom never, ever thought that she was very smart. Uh, She always uh, thought that she didn't know uh, very much. She would frequently, you know, put herself down thinking, you know, she didn't know how to, you know, properly write this letter that she needed to write or, or figure out these, this, 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 you know, this column in the, in, in the, in the checkbook or something like that. She didn't do very good at math. She said in school, she frequently mentioned, by the way, that she only went to grade eight in school. And that she didn't do very well in school. And hence, she was saying she wasn't very well educated, wasn't very well smart. Now, of course, uh, she was quite wrong in all of that self-assessment. I actually have uh, some of her report cards from those years, those eight years that she was in school. And when I read down through them, I see excellent marks, excellent marks, and very positive remarks from the teachers every, after every term. I told her one time that there's a difference between being educated and being smart. And that there are all kinds of people out there who are highly educated, but they're about as smart as a turnip when it comes to to life and and living and knowing how to do that. And that didn't help mom very much. Anyway, but one of the results of this sense that mom had about herself was that she always wanted better for her kids. For us, therefore, to go to school and to work hard at it and to get good marks, that was important for my mom as it was that we actually complete school, that, that we graduate, that was important to her. So you can imagine at home in the evenings, she always made sure that we were uh, doing our homework and getting it done. And if we didn't have decent marks, for example, at Christmas time, uh, well, there was a plan put in place that made sure that that wouldn't happen at the end of the year. Normally, the plan had to do with certain restrictions that were now in place. Like we couldn't watch so much TV or we couldn't go out as much. And we had to study a little more rules that we had to follow. And it's kind of the, you know, the strict parenting kind of thing to us at that particular point, And we rebelled against it. But, you know, the reality is that mom simply wanted the best for us. She wanted to see her children prosper. She wanted to see them succeed. That's a mother's heart. That's a mother's heart for her children. Well, again, as I reflected on that particular characteristic, that verse in Jeremiah chapter 29 came to my mind that we all know that says, you know, this is God speaking to his children, the Israelites. And he says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. They were, they were in exile in Babylon at the time. They, life was not good for them. And God wanted something better for them. He wanted them to prosper. He wanted them to succeed. That's, that's the, the, the mother's heart in, in our father, God. And I think he wants the exact same thing for us friends. And, and I think we see that most clearly in him sending his son, Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10? One of the things he said about his purpose for coming to this earth, he said this, he said, I I am come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. In other words, that you might have this abundant life, that you might prosper in, in this life that has been given to you. By the way, Jesus isn't, you know, talking here about us prospering materially. He's not talking about us succeeding in this world so that we can have all the amenities and the comforts, comforts of, of life here. You know, if God does bless us in that kind of way, you need to know that he has a higher purpose for, for doing so a higher purpose than just our success or our comfort. And, and actually you and I, if we're in that position, you and I will never actually experience the abundant life that he talks about in John 10 until we discover and embrace and carry out God's purpose for our material prosperity. Because the abundant life that he promises to us 
is not that kind of thing. But here, here's the abundant life. It's, it's expressed in a prayer that Paul prayed uh, concerning the Ephesians, the, the Christians in, in, in Ephesus. It's in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14 and following. Here's the abundant life that Jesus came to give to us. Here's Paul's prayer. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, this is out of God's riches. God wants to give us his riches. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to succeed. But here's, here's how he described it. I pray that out of his glorious riches, God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love, which surpasses knowledge that, and here it is, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That friends is the life that Jesus came to bring to us being filled to all the fullness of God. That's the abundant life. That's the best life that, that, that the mother heart of God, our father wants for us. That's what a mother's heart wants for her children. Okay. A third observation I've observed that a mother's heart, you know, always comforts her children in sickness or in distress. You know, no one likes to be sick. We didn't like that when we were growing up, but at home, there was always an upside, you know, to having a, a sore throat or feeling sick or for having a little bit of a temperature. Uh, one of them was the fact that you didn't have that you didn't have to go to school. But but more than that, when you were sick, you became to a large degree the center of attention for mom. Not that she fretted over you and worried over you and pampered you in any way or or or, or doted on you or anything like that. But what I mean is that she paid particular attention to you. And to your well-being and your comfort when you were sick. You know, do you want, do you want to have some 7-Up? Well, of course. We didn't get any other time except when we were sick. Uh, can I get you anything? Um, are you hungry? What, what, can I, what can I get you to eat? Um, you know, your temperature's up. I'm going to go get you some, some aspirin. Um, you, you just need to stay in bed and rest, not try to do anything. Those kinds of things. When, when I was 11 or 12, somewhere in there, um, I somehow contracted pneumonia and I'd gone to the doctor and, and you know what? He put me in the hospital for two weeks. For two weeks, I was in the hospital uh, with pneumonia. And you know, every, every day of those two weeks, mom came to the hospital or mom and Graham came to the hospital or mom and dad came to the hospital, but always mom. She came to spend the afternoon or part of the day with me. What was that all about? Well, friends, her mother's heart would not allow her to stay home while one of her children was in the hospital. So, so you, can, you can well imagine uh, when one of my younger brothers uh, also ended up in the hospital for, I think it was two or three days, a couple of nights anyway. Uh, he, was, he was younger. He was probably six or seven, if I remember correctly. Um, when I went into the hospital, you know, I thought it was a great adventure. I actually had a great time there. I liked it there. I liked being in there. Um, I didn't want to come home <laughs> when it, when I was allowed to come home, but my brother didn't like it there at that age. He didn't like it there. And you know, every time that, that mom had to leave for the night. And in those days, you know, when visiting hours were over at the hospital, visiting hours were over, y you had to leave. You couldn't stay with anyone. Even if it was your child, you couldn't stay with them overnight. But, but, but every time that mom had to leave for the night, my brother would not want her to leave. And he would cry and he would cry and he would sob and he would cry. He wanted mom to stay or else he wanted mom to take him home with her. But she couldn't and she had to leave. So you know, you know, don't you? Who else did a lot of crying during those two or three days? Yeah, it was mom. And why? Because of her mother's heart. Her mother's heart that is wired to comfort her children and to be with her children and to look after her children when they are sick or when they are, when they're in distress, certainly not to leave them. In the introduction to his second letter to the Corinthian church, uh, the apostle Paul describes God, our father in these terms in chapter one and verses three and four. Listen to what he says. He says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he describes them with these terms, the father of all compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles. Don't you like that? 
In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1, we have God himself saying, comfort, comfort my people. Speaking again to his children who were in exile in Babylon. God, friends, is the God of all comfort. That's a motherly characteristic of our Father God. I, I think I want to encourage you um, in this light, and, and when we're dealing with this, encourage you uh, never to listen to the enemy of your souls when he comes and whispers in your ear or whispers to your heart when you're in sickness or when you're in distress, when he comes and whispers you know, that God doesn't care. Because he'll do that. He, he will get you to, to think perhaps that you are alone. He'll get you to think that God has forgotten about you or that he's not in any way, he's not anywhere near to you and that he has, he has nothing to offer you to help you. I, I want to encourage you to rebuke that thought and do it with Paul's affirmation that, that our God, he is the father of all compassion and he's the God of all comfort and he comforts us in all of our troubles. There, there's, there's that old hymn that we sing, it asks this question, does Jesus care? And the first verse goes like this, does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song and the burdens press and the cares distress and, and the way grows weary and long. And then the refrain uh, affirms this, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. And when the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know that my savior cares because he is the God of all comfort. Okay, my final observation uh, about a mother's heart is this. A mother's heart is willing to die for her children. They may not ever have to actually do that, but a mother's heart, I believe, is always willing to die for her children. You, you probably don't know this about me, but <clears throat> I came to within a few hours of never ever making it into this world. Uh, I'm the second of seven children. I have an older sister, and then I have um, five younger siblings. When my mom was pregnant with my sister, she was deathly sick. Actually, for the whole nine months, she was deathly sick. And as a matter of fact, she was so sick that, that during that time, there were three different times that she almost died. They didn't know whether she was going to make it through the night, didn't know whether she was going to make it through the day. But she did, and my sister was born. Well, three years later, uh, mom became pregnant again with me. And you know what? The whole thing started all over again. Uh, she got sick. Um, in, those, in those early months, she became just weaker and weaker and weaker because of the sickness. She became sicker and sicker and sicker, so sick that she, she, just, she couldn't even lift her head up on, on the bed or to get out of bed or, or do anything. It got so bad they called her doctor one day. Dr. Baxter was her doctor out of the city here in St. John. Uh, they called him to see if he would come to the house to see what could be done or to maybe to get her to the hospital. I don't know. He couldn't come. Well, actually, he, he was away. I think that was the issue. He was away. But they needed help. And so, so they got hold of another doctor, a doctor over in Hampton somewhere. I don't know what his name was, but he came over. He came over. He, and when he arrived, he, you know, he, he talked to her. He examined her. He got the story of what was going on. And at the end of this visit, what he said to her was, well, listen, I can deal, I can fix this. He said, you, you, you come over to my office on Monday morning and, and we will take care of this. And he said, we will deal with the baby and then I will fix things so that you will never have this problem again. And you know, mom, mom was so weak and she was so, so sick and so afraid that, that she was going to die or face death again in, the, in this pregnancy that she decided that the only thing she, she could do, the only option she did have was to go and have this procedure done. Well, on the Monday, uh, my Graham came up to go with my mom to have to, over to, to have this procedure. Uh, but before they left, they, they, they started talking about this. They just got talking. And in the midst of the conversation, my mom decided that she wasn't going to go through with it. She wasn't going to do this. She was going to try to carry this pregnancy. She was going to try to have this baby. And so she didn't go. And I am here today. Uh, Mom told me this story later on in, in her life. And, and when I got reflecting on that story, I realized what this decision that my mother made said about my mother. And it comes down to this. What it said was this, that she was willing to risk dying so that one of her children might live. She was willing to risk dying so that one of her children might live. 
See, a mother's heart is willing to do that kind of thing and those kinds of things for her children. And again, I will simply say, you know what? This is a motherly, a motherly characteristic of God, our Father, of His heart. God, you see, is the Father of all human beings in the sense that, you know, He, he created us human beings. And it's in that sense that every human being is a child of God. Well, you know, when John says that God so loved all of these children, that God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, he's talking about that motherly characteristic of our father's heart that is willing to suffer death for the sake of his children. Because that's what God did for us in Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 5 and 8 and following, he says, you see, at just the right time, when we were powerless, in other words, we were powerless to do anything to save ourselves, Christ died for the ungodly. And God commends his love to or demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were helpless, while we were lost, Christ died for us. See, friends, the reality about all of us is that is this, that that all of us are just like I was in the womb of my mother. In the womb of my mother, I was helpless. There was nothing whatsoever I could do myself to save myself. There was nothing I could do to survive the fate that this doctor was proposing Hear me on this. The only thing that saved me was my mother's heart that was willing to risk death so that I might live. And friends, the mother's heart of God, our father, not only risked risked death, but he actually died for us so that we might live because it's by his death that we can have our sins forgiven it's by his death that we receive that, that abundant life, that, that life that lasts forever. Friends, the mother's heart of God, our father provides that for us through faith in Jesus. Well, that's essentially my word of encouragement to today. I, I, I want to, to, to say to you that I hope that on this mother's day, you will all Um, Go before God and give thanks to him for your mothers. Give thanks to him for her love for you that made it so she always makes it so that she always wants you to be near or that she always wanted you to be near. That love that always wanted the best for you. That love that always comforted you when you were in trouble. That love that was actually willing to die for you, whether they, even though they didn't have opportunity for that or didn't have a need for that in, in perhaps... And then I want you to give, encourage you to give praise to God for his love for you. His love for you that causes him to always want you to be close to him and to be with him and live that with God life. That love that always wants the best for you. He wants you to have that life and that abundant life. That love that always comforts you in all the situations of life. And that love that was willing to die for you, that you might live forever. Let me pray. And then I have just one announcement for you. Gracious God, we uh, do want to thank you for your heart. We thank you that you are our father, but that you also have the heart of a mother. Um, And that you love us dearly. And that you do want us to live that with God life. You do want for us to be near you. You do want for us to experience abundant life. You do, Heavenly Father, want to comfort us in all of our troubles. You do want, Lord, for us to know your death for us so that we might live forever. So, Lord, I just pray that you would help us as we consider these things uh, to listen to your call upon our lives, whatever that might be for each and every one of us. And today, Lord, we thank you for all of the mothers who are uh, a part of our lives. We thank you for their their love, their commitment, their just who they are, Lord, what they have done, what they have given to their children, to their families. Lord, we pray that today mothers would sense uh, your blessing upon them. We pray that mothers would know uh, your, your amen to their lives and what they have given, what they have sacrificed, what they have, have done for others, Lord. Bless them with a special day today. And I pray that families might be able to somehow to express their love and their, appreciate, their appreciation to their mothers in one way or another. The doors would open for that. However, that happens in this COVID-19 time, Lord. 
would you help it to happen? So we thank you. And we thank you for this day. And we thank you that it's a day you have made. And so, Lord, we rejoice in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for uh, listening in this morning. Um, I just want to mention to you that we also have another posting for as part of our Mother's Day celebrations today. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to click on that. It's on our Facebook page and also on our, our web page. And that is just three uh, tributes that are given. Three members of our congregation have, um, have agreed to just share a tribute to their mothers. And I know you'll be blessed by that. And so I want to encourage you uh, to, um, yeah, to click onto those and listen to those this morning as part of your, your worship and part of our fellowship together. So please do that. Thank you. Uh, God bless you this week. And we will see you, hopefully, uh, God willing, next week. Bye-bye.